Oop. I can get it. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> My left or your right? <laughs> Everything but this is do not touch. <laughs> Nothing there. All righty, Bill, just talk to me. Okay. And uh, what I want you to start off with is um, Okay. My name is Bill Casing, and uh, I was born in Chicago, Illinois, and I grew up in California. And I essentially had a conventional life until, let's say, I left the aerospace industry. In other words, uh, when the war came along, I went to war. I was in the Navy in the Pacific. After the war, I took the GI Bill, got a degree in English from USC. And then I went to work for Rocketdyne, a division of North American Aviation Incorporated, where I was uh, head of technical publications at the Propulsion Field Laboratory. And there I had secret clearance, uh, AECQ clearance, and other clearances which allowed me to learn all about Apollo, Gemini, Mercury, other space programs. But after seven years at Rocketdyne, I decided I wanted to be an independent freelance writer. So I quit and became an independent freelance writer, and that's what I've been doing ever since. All righty, good. Hold there for a second. All righty, stand by. <clears throat> After I graduated from college, I got a job with Rocketdyne, a division of North American Aviation Incorporated, as a technical writer. And subsequently, I became supervisor of technical publications at the research facility uh, in the Simi Hills. And there, of course, uh, I had to have clearances such as top secret, AECQ clearance, and other clearances which allowed me to know all about Apollo, Mercury, Gemini, and other space programs. Well, I was in charge of technical publications for the entire Propulsion Field Laboratory, which was a research facility for the development of large liquid propellant rocket engines, and of course all the peripheral equipment that goes with them. And my job was essentially writing and editing technical prose regarding uh, this research effort. Yes, actually I found uh, Rocketdyne uh, as a sort of white collar WPA. In other words, the government was pouring billions of dollars into rocket research, but much of the money was wasted. And after a while I got the feeling I'm wasting myself too. I'd rather do something more productive. Uh, for example, at one point the department that was researching and developing vernier engines, which are control engines, um, they ran out of a contract. But the entire group stayed at the Propulsion Field Laboratory doing nothing. They would play Battleship, read newspapers, go for walks, uh, have fun in, in the boonies. And uh, I thought this was a ridiculous waste of the taxpayers' money. and everyone's time. And how long a period did this go on? 
<laughs> well, that particular department, they discovered them after about a year and uh, dispersed them, found them other, other white, collar, white collar WPA jobs. Oh, mainly the development of large liquid propellant rocket engines and everything that goes with it. In other words, turbo pumps that pump the propellants, uh, safety measures to keep people from being killed, uh, the development of uh, extremely sophisticated instrumentation. They could measure anything from a few grams of pressure to millions of pounds of pressure. Uh, it was a fascinating period in my life because I learned a lot about, uh, let's say, cutting-edge engineering. And you talked about uh, rocket failure. Uh, in fact, you mentioned something that uh, failure that a particular rocket engine had so many times consecutively. Can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, the Atlas engine, which was developed at Rocketdyne, was used, of course, to propel the Atlas intercontinental ballistic missile. However, it didn't work too well. In fact, at one point, 14 Atlas D, which was the latest model, exploded consecutively at Vandenberg Air Force Base. They blew up in the air, downrange, on the pad, so uh, the Atlas engine reliability was uh, very low. And this, of course, gave me a very dim view of space, space travel, rockets in general. Now, was this particular type of engine a precursor to the development of the ones used in Apollo? Yes, it was, Bart. Uh, the uh, Atlas engine was a smaller version of the F-1 engine that was used in the Saturn V for the alleged trips to the moon. Were uh, these failures documented to the press? Uh, not always. In fact, a lot of what went on at the Propulsion Field Laboratory, which was heavily guarded, you know, a very secure area, much of what, what went on was withheld from the press. For example, we use such propellants as uh, UDMH, or unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, and that with, uh, say, nitrogen tetroxide. Uh, all of these propellants were toxic to some degree, but the public never knew it. All they heard was sort of a roar coming from the Simi Hills and a lot of smoke coming up, but that's all they knew. Well, after I quit Rocketdyne, I became a freelance writer. I got a book contract, and needing a good place to live, my wife and I bought a 75-foot Coast Guard cutter, which had been converted to living aboard. Well, there were a lot of homeless people near where we stayed at the Oakland Marina, so we invited them to come and stay on the boat. After all, it was 75 feet long, lots of room. So one of the men was a Vietnam veteran with a heroin habit. His name was John Grant. And he said, Bill, the government really screwed me. They taught me how to kill. They sent me to Vietnam. I killed a lot of innocent people. He says, I'm very bitter at this corrupt government. He said, you're a writer. Why don't you write something outrageous like, say, we never went to the moon. And that's exactly where I got the idea from John Grant in 1974 at the Oakland Marina. Prior to that time, I, like almost everybody else in the United States, believed that we went to the moon. What uh, gave you the first suspicion that the flights were fraudulent? The first suspicion came when I flew to Las Vegas to write the book. I got a contract to write it from Price, Turner and Sloan in L.A. So I went to Vegas where they have a large NASA library. And I picked, that, picked up one of the books, and it told about a man named Thomas Ronald Barron. Now, Barron was an inspector on Pad 34, where Grissom, Chafee, and White were burned to death. After this disaster, Barron was called before a congressional investigating committee and asked to tell about his experiences. 
Well, Baron told about all kinds of inept work, mismanagement, total incompetence, people being drunk on the job. In other words, he gave a revelation that Apollo wasn't going to work because of the failure of NASA and North American aviation. Four days later, Thomas Ronald Barron was killed in an alleged automobile accident at a railway crossing near Titusville, Florida. And Thomas Ronald Barron is the, was the turning point for me in the investigation of Apollo. I believe that anybody who tells the truth and is killed it's very likely that they were telling the truth. Okay, about the, tell uh, me again from the top about Barron. And oh, about Barron, after yeah. I've gone to Vegas to, to research the book, right. right? Okay. So, a little bit about his background, who he was, what right. did he do for the Apollo program, okay. uh, what year did he write the report, right. how this coincided with the Apollo 1 program. Okay, all right. Ready? Yep. When I went to Las Vegas, they had a complete inventory of records of Apollo. In reading through these records, I encountered a man named Thomas Ronald Barron. Well, Tom Barron had been an inspector on Pad 34, where subsequently Grissom, Chafee, and White were burned to death. But prior to this disaster, Barron wrote a 500-page report which described and detailed the mismanagement and incompetence of both NASA and North American Aviation, the prime contractor. In telling these details, which he later related to Congress, it became evident that everything was not well with Apollo. And that's why Barron wrote this report. He wanted it to be known that things were not going the way they should. And I should mention that at the same time, General Sam Phillips, who was in charge of the entire Apollo program, wrote his own report to James Atwood, the president of North American Aviation, and told him of his tremendous disappointment in the slippage of schedules for Apollo. So we have Barron and we have General Sam Phillips both saying the same thing. Well, Barron testified before the Congressional Investigating Committee concerning the death of Grissom, Chafee, and White on Pad 34. During his testimony, he was discredited. People came up and said, oh, you're full of baloney. It's not this way at all. But Barron had the facts. He had his own report, and he cited many details from this report during his testimony. But after he testified, unfortunately, he took a drive in his car, and he was killed at a railway crossing. Okay. Keep your roll on that. Okay, go ahead and tell me about that again. Okay. Apollo was a military project, and it was completely controlled by the United States Air Force as represented by General Sam Phillips. He headed the whole thing. He had complete control. He could say yes or no to anything, to anybody, including North American Aviation, the prime contractor. And he could also make his either pleasure or displeasure known to NASA. He was the top man for all of Apollo. Problems with communication and getting messages uh, that uh, quality control uh, to your superior once that report is further up the chain of command. Tell me about some of the things in the Barron report. Okay. The Barron report detailed such things as employee incompetence, employee drinking on the job, employee not uh, abiding by safety regulations. He also described how certain parts which should have been cleaned before they were installed were not cleaned. Uh, in general, what Barron was trying to say is that 
the work on Pad 34, which he was inspecting, was actually done by a bunch of, I'll say it, hoodlums, people who cared less about what they were doing than their paychecks every Friday. He made this very clear in his 500-page report. Uh, the Congressional Investigating Committee called Tom Barron to the stand to have him testify about what he knew concerning the death of Grissom, Chafee, and White. During his testimony, <clears throat> he was discredited by a number of different people. Apparently, they wanted to shoot Barron down to discredit him as though what he was saying was not true. But obviously, what he was saying was true because everything he wrote in his technical reports was corroborated and embellished by General Sam Phillips. And of course, after he testified, he went for a drive in his car, and he was killed at a railway crossing with his wife. Okay. Yeah, okay. Four days after Thomas Ronald Barron testified before the Congressional Investigating Committee, he took a drive with his wife and stalled at a railway crossing. The train came through and he and his wife were both killed. And I should add that despite Florida law, <clears throat> he was not autopsied, nor was his wife. They were both promptly cremated. And that was the end of that story. Okay. Now, uh, it was him who claimed that the Apollo 1 astronauts tried to get out of the uh, capsule about five minutes before the fire yes. became fatal. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, according to um, Barron, he talked to a man named Marvin Holmberg, H-O-L-M-B-U-R-G. According to Holmberg, the men in the capsule who were doomed tried to get out of the capsule five minutes before it caught on fire and burned them all to death. But interestingly, when Barron was testifying, Holmberg was also called in, and he denied ever telling Barron this story about the astronauts trying to get out five minutes before the fire uh, killed them. twice out of three times. What do you think of this story, gentlemen? Very Interesting? Tell us about the, uh, uh, was the Land Rover, did that cost six billion dollars, is that correct, the Land Rover? Um, I'm not sure how much it cost, dollars? really. Uh, I would uh -huh. have to waive that fact. Uh, would you say that once more, please? Yeah. Tell us about how curious it is that they didn't bring a telescope to the moon. Oh, yeah. Or even photograph stars simply by themselves. Yeah, right. Uh, one of the strongest pieces of evidence that men have la never landed on the moon is the fact that they never discussed stars, they never took photographs of stars, even though any astronomer will tell you that the sight of the celestial heavens from the surface of the moon by astronauts would have been breathtaking, overwhelming, and certainly would have evoked a tremendous response on the part of any human being on the moon. Now, what I have to ask is, why didn't the astronauts take a telescopic camera to the moon and take pictures of Saturn, Venus, Mars, the galaxies? They could have gotten pictures of the stars that are impossible to get on Earth because of the atmospheric interference. All right. Tell us about the, uh, the micrometeorites. Micrometeorites are 
particles ranging in size, say, from a grain of sand on up to something formidable like the size of a human fist. Well, micrometeorites rain on the surface of the moon constantly. It's known that 25,000 meteorites enter the Earth's atmosphere every day. But they don't harm anybody because the majority of them are burned up by the atmosphere and their very, very rapid transit. On the moon, there's no atmosphere. The meteorites rain down on everything, on anybody who happens to be there, any equipment on the surface. <clears throat> Had astronauts gone to the moon, they would have been pelted and pierced by micrometeorites traveling up to 30,000 miles per hour. One wonders why <clears throat> they were able to get such perfect photographs on the moon when obviously micrometeorites could have gone right through the Hasselblad cameras and the film. <clears throat> You know, Bart, I really know so little about that. Uh, Rene is such an expert <laughs> that I, I'll, I'll beg off on that point because okay. I know little or nothing about uh, the radiation in space, but he has it down absolutely cold. Uh, tell us about the, uh, <clears throat> uh, what about the air conditioning in the lunar module? Oh, yeah. Well, I can talk about that. Okay. Uh, the lunar module on the moon was assailed by sunlight unobstructed by any atmosphere. The surface of the moon, when the sun is shining on it, is about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. One has to ask, how were the astronauts able to air cool or water cool or cool in any way the interior of the lunar excursion module? They only had batteries, and batteries run down very quickly when they're running air conditioning equipment. So it's obvious to almost anybody who investigates the lunar excursion module that there would have been no way to keep the astronauts alive in an environment that was hot enough to bake cookies. Tell us about the type of engine the LMU used. <clears throat> How you Oh, you mean the lunar uh, ascent and descent engines? Right. Okay. Uh, the lunar ascent and descent engines were propelled by hypergolic propellants. And that means that propellants which, when they are mixed, ignite spontaneously. Now, these two propellants produce a very hot red gas. I've seen them tested at Rocketdyne many times. In photographs taken on the moon, there is practically no visible gas being emitted from the ascent engine when it takes off, nor is there any indication when they are descending that there is this cloud of red gas underneath the lunar excursion module. The sounds of engines run up in excess of 150 decibels. This is far beyond the capability of anybody to converse when you have sound at that high level. Now, the engines inside the lunar module, both the descent engine and the ascent engine, emitted this type of noise. And yet, in broadcasts from the moon, we hear the astronauts conversing in a normal tone of voice and saying things like, quiet ride. Now what about the, uh, the engine and uh, the fact that there was no crater under the landing? One of the strongest pieces of evidence that no one has ever landed on the moon is the fact that underneath the lunar module, underneath the engine cone, the jet nozzle, there is no crater. And yet, in all of the drawings done by NASA artists prior to Apollo, they show a tremendous crater being gouged out by this 10,000-pound thrust jet engine of the lunar descent module. 
I would say that the strongest piece of evidence other than the stars is the fact that there is no disturbance underneath the lunar excursion module upon its landing. Tell us uh, about, <coughs> if it were fake, why they deleted mentioning that stars are photographic stars. What was the reason behind that? Well, the reason they couldn't mention stars or take photographs of stars is that the astronomy buffs at Vanderbilt or Harvard or UCSC would have found the errors instantly. Okay, fine. Um, his experience to the moon, his conversion to Christianity, right. uh, his friend and you know, the person who spoke with him here. Right. Do you uh, want me to mention him by name? I think so. Okay, why yeah. not? Yeah. <clears throat> of course, Lee is kind of a reclusive person, but I don't mind mentioning his name. We, can. we can't live forever. <laughs> <clears throat> Ready? Yeah. James Irwin was the command pilot on Apollo 13, on a, pardon me, on Apollo 15. Uh, James, after his return from the moon, became a born-again Christian. At one point, he came to Nashville, Tennessee, to give a lecture on Christianity and his conversion there, too. And at that time, he met a local Nashville resident by the name of Lee Galvani. Well, Lee implored James Irwin to confess, to tell the truth about the Apollo hoax, of which Lee was convinced. Well, evidently, he made some inroads in, into Jim Irwin's conscience because in August of 1991, James Irwin called me at my home. And he said, I understand you've written a, a, a book called We Never Went to the Moon. He says come to think of it, this phone could be tapped. He says, I want you to call me at my home on Friday in, in, uh, in uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado. So I said, okay, Jim, I'll call you. And he gave me his home phone number. Well, when I called him on Friday, James Irwin was dead. He had died of a heart attack. Oh, sure. Uh, I was doing a radio show, and an airline's pilot called in, and he says, Bill, I think you're right, because I was flying nonstop from San Francisco to Tokyo, and I saw a C-5A cargo plane drop a capsule out of the cargo hold. The orange parachutes came open, and the capsule dis descended toward the ocean. And even though we were traveling about 550 knots, we were able to track and see the parachutes and the capsule descending at a time when the astronauts were allegedly coming back from the moon. He says, I can't give you my name or my airline company because I need my job. Yeah, let's just tell us that story one more time from the top. Sure. And go ahead. While I was on a radio show, concerning Apollo, an airline pilot called me and he said, Bill, I think you're right, because while I was traveling from San Francisco to Tokyo, we saw a C-5A drop a capsule out of its cargo hold. The orange, three orange paras parachutes opened and it descended toward the ocean. And even though we were traveling at about 550 knots, we followed this descent as long as we could. Uh, now tell us about the uh, steam, or the lack of steam at your... Okay. What the, you know, how hot it would be, <coughs> why it would be hot. Okay. Like uh, when the command capsule returns to Earth, the atmosphere causes it to become red hot due to friction at high speed. Well, when a command capsule strikes an ocean, which is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, this red-hot capsule should have turned a large volume of seawater into steam instantly, just like when you pour 
water into a hot pot on the stove, it immediately, it's called flashing into steam. But in all of the photographs showing the capsule hitting the water, there's no indication whatsoever of any steam, of any indication that the capsule was really red hot. A newspaper clipping or something? Uh, I have sent for a copy of the December 8th Mercury News, which should contain the story of the KOME bombing. And if I don't get it from them, I'll try and get it from the FCC. Okay. Uh, let's start this off with in 19 whatever the year was I, that you wrote the book, and subsequently that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Fine. And go ahead. Uh, the first edition of We Never Went to the Moon came out in 1975 in the spring, and copies were distributed through the media. And I began getting telephone calls from all over the United States wanting interviews. And I did perhaps 100, maybe 150 radio and television, telephone, and personal appearances regarding my book. Well, on January, pardon me, on December 7th, 1975, I was invited to discuss my book at radio station KOME in San Jose, California. The moderator or talk show host was Victor Bach. About halfway through the broadcast, the engineer came into the control room, or the room where we were giving our, uh, our information, and he said, we're off the air. Subsequent, in, uh, subsequent investigation indicated that someone in a helicopter had dropped napalm on the KOME transmitter in the Gilroy Hills, causing a quarter of a million dollars worth of damage and effectively cutting off the station from the air for three days. Well, police came to the station and offered us police protection because callers into the station said, what happened to you? You had this fellow on about we never went to the moon and suddenly your radio station goes off the air. So to me, this was the first real life indication that there was somebody that didn't want me to tell this story. Now remind me who is Bob Edwards? I have that down there. Sure. Okay. Bob Edwards is a graduate of Stanford. He has a degree in communications. And he called me up a year ago and said, Bill, I'd like to do a tape for my master's degree in communications. So he came over to my home and filmed me in 16 millimeter color film for several hours, took it back and made a videotape. But strangely, uh, the tape has never been distributed. And uh, Bob seems reluctant to discuss it. Now which NASA records are considered to be uh, not classified but not available? All of the records concerning Apollo are not classified, and yet they are unavailable to the public. One has to ask why. What do these records contain? Uh, say again. What would these records contain? Uh, oh, they would contain a wealth of information on, say, launch speed, scheduling, timing, problems, temperatures on the moon, temperatures in space, uh, the performance of uh, all of the major engine components, verniers, uh, instrumentation readings. I mean, there would be literally thousands of pages of data on Apollo that actually investigators need to prove one way or another whether, whether we really went to the moon. In 1959, I was working with advanced research at Rocketdyne, and their own studies proved that radiation levels on the moon were lethal. This corroborated Russian research. The Russians claimed that for a man to survive on the moon with the radiation emitted from solar and cosmic sources, he would have to be shielded by four feet 
of solid lead. At that time, advanced research at Rocketdyne made a statistical analysis of the likelihood that we could go to the moon and come back, and the likelihood was something like one chance in 10,000. This report can be obtained, and I will try to obtain it for you. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, Bart, he doesn't have any direct connection with this project. Bob is a, a Ph.D. With a, with a doctorate from Caltech, summa cum laude, most brilliant physicist I've ever met. But uh, he has, let's say, mixed feelings about Apollo. The man who? Hindman, who came to visit you? Oh, oh, yeah, Hindman, Hindman, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Shortly after I publicized uh, the Moon book on radio and television, a man came to my condo in Santa Cruz claiming to be from the Manned Space Center in Houston. And he said, Bill, I work for the Space Center but I don't want to work for them if they're a bunch of liars. He says, can you give me any documented evidence that we've never gone to the moon? He says, if I know that we've di we haven't gone to the moon, I'm going to quit. And actually, he was very diffident, quite shy. He brought his mother with him. And I gave him a few pieces of paper, and I told him, frankly, I don't have anything that isn't available to any other U.S. citizen. And he left. Subsequently, I learned that Hindman was an, a direct employee of Neil Armstrong. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Petrus satellite. Uh, in 1969, in the spring, a satellite called Tetra, T-E-T-R-A, was launched to simulate radio transmission from the moon. It circled the Earth, it emitted these radio signals, and people on Earth could receive them and, of course, let's say erroneously believe that they came from the moon. So I think that your viewers can conclude what the real purpose of the Tetra satellite was. Tell us that again from the top of mentioned that it was launched, uh, you know, as a training exercise, part of Apollo. Okay, uh, right. All right. Uh, as part of the training phase of Apollo, they launched what was called the Tetra satellite, T-E-T-R-A. This satellite emitted signals as though they were coming from the moon. Now, was this voice or, and data or both or what? Uh, you mean what type of signals? Yeah, was it voice, uh, data as well? Well, it, it apparently was designed to emit any type of signal that they wanted to emit. It would be somewhat like a radar transponder. George Pal was an early Hollywood expert on animation. When they created the film Voyage to the Moon, they called on him to present the story in as realistic a fashion as he could using combined am animation and, of course, real characters. Well, his film was very successful. People loved it, and it told the story of how rockets might be launched and land on the moon. The interesting thing is, the one thing he was not able to, to simulate correctly were the presence of stars. And the film is available from some of your video rental places, and uh, I highly recommend uh, your viewers to see it. Tell us about Bill Wood, uh, how you came in contact with each other, in particular what he said about the types of emission and that potentially a different type of rocket was used. Right. Uh, Bill Wood uh, is a rocket scientist. He's been in the business for 25 years. He bought a copy of my book and read it, and then he came to see me, which 
did surprise me a little bit because most people <laughs> don't visit me because I have a fairly low profile. But Bill and I became friends, and it turns out that he had done his own investigation of Apollo for many years, and he found my book very interesting. Well, one point that Bill brought out was that the Saturn V vehicle using five F1 engines really was not the configuration that was shown in films of the Saturn V leaving for the moon. Instead, it's Bill's contention that they used less powerful engines and simply added fuel to the jet stream to make it appear as though the Saturn V was using five F1 engines. Well, the reason was that the F-1 engine, which was tested at Edwards Air Force Base, suffered from a problem in large liquid rocket propellant engines of combustion instability. And what happens during combustion instability is that shock waves are set up inside the expansion chamber of the rocket, and they, they resonate and embellish, embellish one another until finally the rocket chamber explodes. And this was the big problem with both Atlas and with F-1 engines. What was Bill's proof that, the, uh, that they substituted engines? Uh, Bill Wood's proof that they substituted engines was the fact that the color of the jet coming out of the Saturn V was incorrect. It should have been white hot. Instead, it was red, showing that it was operating fuel rich. Uh, tell us about what he was doing prior to the current condition and if that coincided the timing of that with any, anything. Uh, you mean his, uh, his having a stroke? Right. Oh. And what age he is. <clears throat> Bill Wood was helping me with my investigation and uh, definitely contributed to a lawsuit which I filed against uh, Apollo 13 astronaut James Lovell. I filed a suit <clears throat> on November, pardon me, on August 19th. One day later, Bill Wood suffered a severe stroke which eliminated his power of speech and the use of the right side of his body. Connection to what? What was Bill Wood's connection to the lawsuit? To the lawsuit? Yeah. Um, Bill Wood and I attended a lecture by James Lovell in San Jose at the convention center where Lovell was talking on leadership, citing his Apollo 13 experiences. After his lecture, Bill Wood and I went up to James Lovell, and I gave Jim a copy of my book, We Never Went to the Moon. He took the book, made no comment, and was quite gracious because he was surrounded by autograph seekers. Bill Wood at the same time told Lovell of his own suspicions that the Apollo project wasn't real. And of course, again, Lovell uh, in public view could really not be anything but courteous to both of us. So that was Bill Wood's contribution at that point. Subsequently, <clears throat> he wrote a report, which I have, concerning his belief that uh, the Apollo project was a gigantic hoax. And what period of time was it after writing the report that he had the stroke? Uh, what period of time after? After he wrote that report to the time he had a stroke. Uh, between the time of his writing this report and his having the stroke was probably about four months. Well, according to uh, Dr. Van Mulen, who's an astronomer at Leiden University in Holland, he claims that Stan Kubrick <clears throat> was hired by NASA to write the scripts for Apollo 11, 12, and 13. 
Well, Stan is a very intelligent movie maker, and he knows that people get bored seeing the same things over and over again. He knew that by the end of Apollo 12, people would want to see something different. <clears throat> so he came up with a script in which Apollo 13 fails. A tank explodes. They have trouble in space. And this focuses renewed attention on Apollo. Well, evidently, Kubrick's script was picked up by NASA, and they carried out the script exactly the way he wrote it. Tell us about kind of the public's opinion at the time of Apollo. <clears throat> 12? Yeah, I mean, after 12, why would it be in the, in the NASA's interest for him <clears throat> to be able to jeopardy uh, involved? Well, Apollo 11 actually fulfilled America's desire to get somebody to the moon and return him. <clears throat> Apollo 12 was a repetition of Apollo 11. They went to the moon and they came back. People weren't interested anymore. In other words, once you've seen something, you really don't want to see it again. The enthusiasm of people to the Apollo 12 astronauts was greatly diminished. So NASA knew that by the time Apollo 13 came along, <clears throat> they would probably have to buy time on television networks to get their story publicized. So that's why they came up with Apollo 13 as a uh, simulated disaster. Why exactly uh, are you suing them? What's the accusation? Uh, say again, please. Why are you suing Lovell? What's the actual oh. charge? Oh, well, uh, I gave Jim Lovell a copy of my book, and he took it back to uh, Lake Forest, Illinois, where he lives, and he read it, and he wrote me a rather scathing letter <clears throat> condemning the book and condemning me and saying that I uh, really had a uh, low intelligence. But subsequently, a newspaper in San Jose called Metro interviewed Mr. Lovell, and during the interview he stated that I was wacky <clears throat> on the basis of reading just one of my 20 books. <clears throat> Well, I took offense at that, particularly since it was published in a paper with a half a million circulation, and I felt that it would damage my reputation as an alternative writer. So I went to Superior Court in Santa Cruz and filled out all the papers and filed a suit against him and uh, incidentally found him very, very hard to find. It turns out he only spends one hour a day at home, according to his wife, Marilyn. So uh, I hired a process server for $150, and they finally presented my summons to his wife to give to him. He never received it personally. However, after he received it, he hired an attorney by the name of John Paul Hardy, who occupies the entire 35th floor at number one Post Street, San Francisco, and Mr. Hardy will represent him in the forthcoming trial on October 6, 1997. <clears throat> All right. right. Tell us a, just a little bit about your opinion of propaganda films and things like that. Well, since uh, the government, our corrupt government, essentially controls the media, it's no problem for them to produce propaganda films. For example, for many years, John Wayne was presented as a hero as a CB, as a Marine, as an Air Force pilot, or whatever. And he made war seem glamorous and dramatic and uh, something that uh, should occupy a young man's time. I have a Vietnam veteran who said, John Wayne conned me into killing 500 people in Vietnam. So what we're confronted with is a propaganda machine beyond comprehension and well-funded. During World War I, they produced films showing German soldiers spearing Belgian babies. And I might point out that National Geographic ma uh, magazine picked this up and actually had presentations on the subject. And interestingly, National Geographic was one of the prime media to present photographs of astronauts cavorting on the moon. So to summarize, what American citizens are confronted with 
is this enormous propaganda machine. For example, the U.S. Air Force has the largest movie studios and more equipment in San Bernardino than any studio in Hollywood. Tell us about trying to get a copy of the Phillips Report and Barron Report and what that was like. Uh, in attempting to find copies of the 500-page Barron Report, I met with a complete blank wall. NASA, North American Aviation, all claimed that uh, they didn't have the report and they didn't know where to find it. Fortunately, Senator Alan Cranston of California was able to get for me the 50-page Barron Report, which I have, and the 500-page General Sam Phillips Report, which I have. And if your viewers are interested, I'd be delighted to send them copies for simply the cost of copying them. Uh, well, these reports were essentially part of the NASA records. NASA admitted that Barron did write two reports, one 50 pages and one 500 pages. So I sought both of them, but was able to find one of them. They also mentioned General Sam Phillips' 500-page report, which was sent to uh, President uh, Jim Atwood at North American Aviation. And incidentally, Jim Atwood denied ever receiving the report. Tell us about the transcript that you got of Barron's congressional testimony. Uh, the transcript of his testimony comes directly from uh, a NASA historical record, and this is available to the public. Uh, the nearest source of this would be the library at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. Um, Gus Grissom was very doubtful about Apollo. He flew to Downey where the capsule was being assembled and studied it very carefully. He wrote reports about his doubts. On the day that he was burned to death in one of the command capsules, he hung a lemon on the outside of it, giving graphic proof of what he really thought of this piece of mechanism. Grissom actually was, uh, let's say, a rebel among the astronauts. He did not believe that things were going well, and he wrote reports about it. Now, the day after he was burned to death, FBI agents burst into his home removed all of his records, particularly those pertaining to Apollo, and according to Beto, Betty Grissom, his widow, they were never returned. Tell us about the number of uh, parts. Uh, uh, kind of take, take us through statistically uh, the failure that you saw and the number of parts and components involved in Apollo and in order to carry off the mission successfully. Uh, you mean the uh, the the number of, of parts in the in the unit? Yeah. Like you talk about uh, 80 elements having to work six times and yeah. so many thousands of parts involved. Okay. Uh, Apollo consisted of millions of, of individual components, all of which had to function perfectly. In addition, there had to be 80 particular distinct operations of segments. In other words, the, uh, the booster had to separate from the command capsule. The limb had to be turned around and connected to the capsule. All kinds of things had to happen absolutely on schedule. And this had to happen six times perfectly. Well, statistically, the probability of this happening is very, very slight as any mathematician will tell you. Because mechanical things obey Murphy's and Parkinson's law. If a thing can fail, it will fail at the worst possible time. All right. The, uh, the monkeys, the Soviets and the Americans were uh, launching to test the effects of radiation. 
Could we leave that to Rene because he knows that the monkey business and the radiation uh, so covered a, whole, uh, a lot of the good points. Holmberg, Lovell's lawsuit, uh, stars, crater under the moon. Uh, we would have to, let's say, dilute the presentation if we went into some, well, do you, do you want to go into death threats? I got lots of those. Say that again? I, I threw them in the trash. Oh. Tell me what you did to that again. <laughs> you really want to record it? Sure. Right after I came out with the book, I used to get death threats. These were letters with skull and crossbones, and they'd say, Hey, you commie pinko fink, either lay off of the Apollo hoax or we're, we're going to come and get you. Well, I would say the major anomaly in Apollo photography is the fact that they take pictures of the Earth from the moon, and they could have very easily changed film and stopped down the camera or gave it a longer exposure and taken marvelous pictures of the, of the heavens, particularly of things like Saturn with its rings and Jupiter with its six moons. would have been marvelous, but no photographs that NASA provides ever shows any stars with the exception of a few dim ultraviolet emission stars, which I did find at one time. What about the, some of the shadows not being <clears throat> parallel and things like that? Oh, that's an important point that's been well investigated by other investigators. The fact in many of <clears throat> the still shots, the shadows are not parallel. Well, this can't be if you have the, uh, the sun as a point source of light. Just go out outdoors any time during the day and look at the shadows. They're all exactly parallel because the sun, being 93 million miles away, illuminates them in such a way that they have to be parallel. California, where I can get all issues of the Chronicle on Apollo. And incidentally, I would you like newspapers like the New York Times showing Astronauts land on moon? Yeah. I'll, I'll send them to you. Yeah. I've got Life Magazine and National Geographic. Well, let me send you the New York Times uh, of October 20, 21st, okay. 1969, which says, uh, you know, men land on the moon. Take it away, we'll see what it looks like we're done. Well, 